I was blessed by the beats in the holy temple of city lights. Slammed by the word speakers in Seattle, the star bars sparkled in my eyes. Palooze in a tent of hissing spoken word, I was saved in San Diego by the poet's tree. Sangria Lizzie dazzled me with hot Spanish licks on my cool blue skin. She left my heart beating like a flamenco dancer's shoes. Oracle Mark waits at the intersection of Park and Washington with the angst of Market Street still on his southern comfort lips, hovering over me, smelling of a bad woman in a deep blues dress. Are you a poet, man, he kept saying. Are you a poet? Man, I feel deliverance moving in, spouting hairs from my chin. My hands stroke bongos. My hip feet got the beat. Down the sidewalks past Kerouac Sally. He was out with Sally, drinking again, thinking about going to Mexico. Alan was howling in the fog that blanketed North Beach. Bukowski slumming in a hotel, raw soul, saying that poetry just saved his ass. Ferlinghetti lives in city lights, spends nights painting pictures by the window. Beat, 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 my feet hit the street and I was out there. Way out there, man, silver plane, giving me wings, a bag full of word things, spilling from a shuttle that drove me home. Dangerous Dan, the word man, he met me at the gate, said I'd be late for reading needy readers. Exceedingly tired, I pulled my felt hat down. The poet man was back in town. <laughs> Okay, if you want to look, uh, you want to look on the book, uh, page number 21, it's called El Spatuna Rag. <clears throat> I wrote this in uh, Stockholm, and I was walking back to the ship I was staying on, it was snowing. And so, the snowflakes are dancing around me, and I am smiling. Ginsburg is sleeping in Izzy's basement, and I am smiling as Dylan's ghost downs another whiskey, and I am drunk on IPA. Charlie Chapman, oops, missed that one. <laughs> that, that's the problem with having people read along. <laughs> they show up, don't they, Chris? <laughs> as I read, scream, slam poetry. Standing on top of the piano where Tom Waits bangs out a new tune with a cigarette dangling from his lower lip. Charlie Chapman taps his cane, listening to the thumping beat of sweet jazz blues. As a psychedelic jukebox drops another record onto the turntable of the world, and Bessie Smith melts magic from the microphone, and Miles blows his midnight horn. Marlena catches my eye with a wink, and we are dancing, dancing, dancing. Thank you. Uh, let me see. The second one in this book would be uh, what is beat? My uh, brother-in-law's brother, I stand with over in Luton. Uh, he asked me what beat was, and so uh, as soon as I left him, I went. I was on my way down to to Dover, and I wrote this. He asked me what beat was, so I told him. Beat is not a what. Beat is an it. It's jazz blues crying out on a night of moody stars over a city that never sleeps. It's a struggle of hard bones and empty bottles. It's dreams left sleeping by the click-clack railroad tracks and dreams waking on the beach with the taste of last night's drunk still in your mouth. It's calling out your lover's name so loud that it shakes the sky to brightness and moves through the day with fierce determination. It's living present and feeling the perception that there will not be another day like this ever. It's balancing feathers and driving around the world with the stereo blasting through the interstellar air. It's blades spinning through the psychedelic movements of wind, powering the lights at the end of the world. Beat is when someone takes all you have and disappears into the fog of missing possibilities and leaves you there crying at a table set for one. Beat is when you don't care anymore that you are beat and you just lean forward and listen to the flapping of your shoes on the hot asphalt of a slow boiling summer's day. Beat is yeah, man. Beat is yeah, man. Beat is yeah, man. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> it's beat children struggling to save a beat planet from plastic bags roiling in a radiated sea. Beat is beat down. Beat is beat up. Beat is life, baby. It eats into you like a hungry worm. 
breaks over you in waves of spent notes spilling wildly from some musician's pinch-lipped horn, then wraps around you like a hot, smooth woman on a cool, warm night. He does a long, slow cry of distant train whistles in the middle of a long, dark dream. It's knowing that you're standing on a path where one journey ends and another one begins. Beat is watching the vapor trails of airplanes crisscrossing the sky and knowing that you'll be somewhere else when tomorrow burns a new experience inside you. It's tapping shoes and nodding heads and wild screams when you can't contain the joy that's inside you. It moves your feet, propels you across the floor, then throws you into the arms of a pretty girl while the musician on stage is smiling because he feels it too. So he starts pounding the piano so hard that the sound is flying out through the electric air as the drummer taps his hi-hat of of unexplored possibilities. Beat is finding the rhythm in the poem. Beat is life, man. Beat is life. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, speaking of Kerouac, uh, my poem about Kerouac is kind of sad, but it's about him anyway. I, I went to, I was living in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida for about a year and a half and went by and saw the last house he lived in with his mom. And uh, this, poem came, this poem came out of that. His elbows would have rested just so, spread wide across the wood bar rail, polished with the sweat of hard-worked men with tired eyes. I see him drained, sheltering from the baking sun and from the humidity that seals his shirt to his skin, raising his head each time the door creaks, wondering if the blood that he coughed up this morning would be his last, or if another wasted day would follow this downward spiral numb as the liquid cool drains through him. Then, after his stumble home, just before the dark of sleep takes him in its kindness, he would remember another road that began with Ginsburg and Burroughs and ended with Neil, dead on the tracks in Mexico. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> Yeah, Neil Cassidy, that, that guy must have been <laughs> somebody to talk to. He was worthy of a book. Yeah. Let me see. One more from uh, Strange Summer. That's, that's, this is uh, the first book I had. Uh, I didn't bring any of these with me, but I got the other two. Uh, this one's available on Amazon, and if you buy it, the publisher will give me another one. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. Oh nice. <laughs> Let me see which one we want to read. I wonder how you did that, Chris, on Spanish. <laughs> 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 I could publish her. No, I don't. So Decaf! I don't drink decaf. Give me caffeine. Make me scream as the brown bean bakes and rotating metal drums. Cappuccino on ice. Latte is nice. Espresso my heart. Squeeze it through steam. Let me sip caffeine. Dripping down thick and strong. Dripping down creamed or chocolated. Sprinkled with nutmeg spice. Little would be nice. More vanilla, please. Squeeze it out of my napkin. Cold but oh so full of caffeine. Give me a coffee bar in my car. I'll put my order in. Fill my two your cup to the brim, top of the plop of whipped cream. What a dream! Oh, caffeine, <laughs> decaf. I don't drink decaf. <laughs> uh, I was born in 1952, and uh, uh, I wrote this poem uh, uh, while I was crossing the millennium. I Breathe My Body Electric. The title comes from uh, Ray Bradbury's short story about a, a nanny who was a robot that grew up with the kids and then had, to, had then left them after, after they had grown up and left. I breathe my body electric where the city hums with scattered light from a million curtain windows. As half the, glab, as, as half the globe passes from day to night, our times are filled with inconsistencies. We are miniaturized. Our vital components have become interchangeable. Space is cluttered with debris. Communication is globally instant. Cell phones ring at inappropriate times. Email will leave us with no lasting marks for the anthropologist to decipher. I am crossing the millennium, already encased in my time at the beginning of the atomic age. 
I have grown nuclear. My future is now. I bow beneath the weight of technology. It drags me behind its spinning polymer wheel constructed of silicone and internet connections as the new past hurries by me with alien signs of change. I am crossing the millennium. I feel obsolete. I cannot stop its progress. It grinds me between, between dollars. I can only move forward covered in sports hype and the latest designer clothes. Time compresses me into smaller and smaller bites, gobbles me up in corporate mergers that plow the field under for the bottom line. They will feed me genetically altered food as they slowly starve the third world. The United Nations struggle with selective strikes as refugees live in, swallows, in squalor camps. They wonder if there will be a home to come home to. I see the brutality of the ethnically cleansed, mass voices broken in a chasm of futility. It leads my soul to slaughter and I cannot wash this spot of blood from my hand. I have pushed the off button on the remote, but I cannot keep this dream of killing from my ears. The line of my arrival stretches from the middle of the last century, travels the beginning of rock and roll, walks the jungles of Vietnam. Born at the birth of the first transistor, the world has grown smaller around me, reduced to nanoseconds, measured in milliamps. Reproduction of species has moved to the laboratory. We sit on a teetering one-leg stool that my grandfather used to milk his cow. I sell my spirit to the highest bidder, unlock my genetic code for the insurance company to find the day I will die, map all there is to know about me for the government. Still the, Asian, the ageless questions worry me. Who am I and why am I here? I breathe my body electric and my body groans. I sigh digitally, look through shaded plastic, cover my ears with foam sound. I am seat belted in climate controlled comfort, encased in steel that has been welded with robotic arms. My fingers have reached into the outerness of space. I listen with a vast array of parabolic ears to the twitching of galaxies that no longer exist. As I gaze light years towards the Big Bang, I smash atoms into quirks and protons, pick skeletons from cold bottoms of oceans, defy grip gravity with liquid nitrogen. I am crossing the millennium of jihad, of second coming, of hopeless intervention, carving my legacy into the flesh of the unborn. Here will be the end of my life in this century that opens before me. Uh, daytime deliri delirium in an overcrowded world. <laughs> kind of my uh, homage to uh, Lewis Carroll, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah this was, no, this was, that wasn't it. That's another poem. So this is a, <laughs> a poem that I wrote in pieces and then took the pieces apart and put them back together. The homeowners were livid, yelling from their many mouths, which occupied both sides of their face. Not in my backyard. No needles, no drugs. No, 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 not in my backyard. The architect drew up plans for expansion, but the grade was too steep, so he took a reading from his horoscope and raised it to a higher plane. <laughs> The elevator operator leaped 47 stories and proceeded to eat pigeons two at a time. The soldier dripped innocent blood on the, on the carpet as he field stripped his war machine while sipping Agent Orange and vodka. Oh. Babies in the third world play with machine guns as unexploded bombs stick softly in their stateroom nurseries. The politician smiled, shook his own hand, and promised action. <laughs> the jogger put foam in his ears and couldn't hear me say good morning. The kid played Nintendo. His eyes jerked uncontrollably, but his body never moved. The academic stared down his bookish nose at misspelled words and asked of degrees and bibliographies. The policeman tattooed sunglasses on the meter maid's face and punched her ticket. She smiled. The whore pulled him over her into her, took a dollar bill and left a quarter size sore on his face for change. The beggar wanted the quarter, but didn't take what was offered. The fat cat snickered with a cheesy smile that folded his face in half, hiding his eyes. The liar ate his lips. The thief stole glances and sold them to sly theology students. 
The martyr buried his cross and thumbed the ride home, hoping that he would not miss the execution of the six o'clock news. The doctor took my temperature, looked at his watch, and told me I would die someday. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, no tree poems. There has already been many poems about a tree. How many times should people write of crickets squeaking in the night? They all lived more simply than writing sonnets to pick chicken pens, nodes to moo cows in the fields, or how a pussy willow feels. But I live in a city away from all that, although I do now own a cat. It's social conscience I do crave, to document and so to save. Enough's been written of twinkling stars, but not too much of fights and bars, so I will write what comes to me, but never a poem about a tree. About uh, page 22, Father Death Blues for Izzy and Alan. When I was over there, uh, I met a guy named Izzy Young from New York City. And he had had a storefront uh, in Times Square before he had moved to uh, Sweden. And he had given Bob Dylan one of his first house concerts in his shop. And I got to meet Izzy. Go, uh, is, is, Israel Goldman is his name. Got to meet him over there. He told me that Alan had sleep uh, that Alan had slept in his basement while I was over there. <laughs> and uh, wrote this poem about. Uh, it was kind of a, it was kind of about that, but it was about Izzy. It's hard when you don't remember when the words become a depth that escapes you. You can see the object that you want to name before you, but. Its name slides to the tip of your tongue and waits there. Mm. You remember its texture and flavor, but the shape of it is gaseous, the trash thing, the eating thing. Its image struggles to materialize into a world of concrete, concrete objectivity, only to, get, only to slip into an unfocused void as the remembered path loses its direction and wanders off, a memory dead-ended in mid-sentence. Mm. The, the days blur and you wonder why, and you wonder, and you wonder just how many years it's been, and you can't believe just how many years it's been, and you feel scared, and you can't remember, and you remember that it has happened before, but you can't remember where it happened or when it happened, but you can remember it happened, and the days pass, and that thing is just a thing, and old friends die, and you are here, but you can't remember their names, and the words just won't come. Wow. Yeah. Close to home. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, he had, I had Izzy had invited me back uh, two days later for a house concert, and he said I could get in free. And then when I showed up, he didn't remember me. So. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why I wrote the poem. <laughs> you got even with him. Memorialized. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Uh, softly raging, page number seventy. This is uh, about the time we went to Devlin Thomas's childhood house in Swansea. Oh, kind of. <laughs> I had been delayed in my travels, retraced my errant steps back up the slow, long hill, stopped, and my lungs screamed for air. When I opened the door, the wind crept in behind me. A chill of dark dreams danced in the corner and moved across the silence of no clock ticking and asked why I wandered here. A faint line of empty chairs shifted. The inevitable glass, half emptied of whiskey, rattled on the three-legged table. The bottle of emotion resting prone upon the floor found my hand around its neck. It whispered its sorrows to me in a sad lament filled with sighs. With a toast for no one who was someone once, this cuddled day has found my lips moving over the verses of his notebook. 
the words tasted of sheets of sea and ash as the night disappeared into a sadness of stars that trembled in the raging light. Uh, how many more? Is that a long time? We're okay with you if you're happy with us. <laughs> I'll read the one I was supposed to read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, what a beginning of it. Now it yeah, was lectured uh, earlier this year about not being prepared when I come <laughs> by, by, a, by a host of another reading. <laughs> no, I, I, you had told me before that I should be prepared, so I was prepared for you. What's that? What's that one? So easy. I'll do the gardener. <laughs> after, the, after the rains of the past week, the gardener digs the weeds. The gardener who lives across the hall from me, his hair dyed in a natural shade of yellow. <laughs> Tattoos spill down his arms, escaping from his black t-shirt sleeves. I hear it, the music escaping, too, from around the door where the air conditioner hums. He is a good gardener, plants cactus and marigolds, but he says his marijuana just won't grow. He says that it's been too hot and that he didn't water it enough. I think it was the squirrels. They seem much happier in the trees today. <laughs> called Disenchanted Garden. The gnome at the foot of the stairs stirs herbal tea with a twig of anise, speaks of holistic remedies with a mint green smile, then hobbles back to his room, mumbling something about being late for a meeting of Jewish organic bakers. <laughs> Bill crouches wearily by your door. It is you who I've come to see. You who I've climbed the moss-covered steps to find, he knows because you feed him smiles and kindness, he knows who you're hungry for. A madman, tall, lanky, seeks escape from nowhere. Trapped in the room next to yours, he rhythmically pounds upon the wall. I hear him screaming about something lost. I have forgotten why he paints the faces in his scrapbook dark blue. Andrea stays in the advent calendar pinned to the door frame. She speaks German, moans erotically at the edge of my eye as SS troopers tramp over her threshold, goose stepping through a fully erect female condom. The sign tattooed above the moist opening reads, I will have a few friends staying in me tonight. All the doors are open now that Christmas has passed. The toilet flushes. Moons replace the sun as the zygote divides again. A small, middle-aged woman reattaches severed limbs of dolls, so stringed through their loose-fitting cloth skin. She makes them dance. Their frozen expressions show nothing of their pain. I find your child climbing through a hole of colored smoke rings, its umbilical cord still attached to the center of your earth. I snatched a small voyager up, place him beneath my coat to keep him warm, cover his ears so that he will not be frightened of the jagged crash worship lyrics spilling from the audio-visual display, hot glued to a wall which breathes heavily and smells of sex. I think I have been here before. Deja Vu was with me then. It was before I went to see tomorrow off at the airport. He promised to be back by this time yesterday. <laughs> I know that you're somewhere close. Food fingers curl from the pot in the stove. Burning sage squeezes my nose, cleanses the space behind my eyes, for I breathe freely and without government intervention. <laughs> I rattle the smiling cat upon your door. He grins, then disappears. Hesitantly, I knock again, hoping that the soup of opportunity is not yet cool. Your smile sucks me through a keyhole, covers me in kisses and chocolate. You pull carpets of grass over us. The mosh pit of our sexual frenzy reminds me of newly dug earthworms. Salty liquids grease the, grease, grease the grist mill of my feelings. The gnome laughs silently and pushes record on the camcorder. He's found what I've come here for. Oh. 
I was in London and I found uh, Mary Magdalene's church. And I read this poem right outside. I had to, had to stop and read it. <laughs> <laughs> she was just passing through on her way to Wisconsin, on her way to Detroit. She would be here for only one week. Her bags were packed with many circumstances. It left no leeway for the pair of eyes that touched the hem of her slip, or for the voice that tumbled her to his feet. She was just passing through, and her feet were there. She felt water and earth. She felt ash. She was just passing through, and his feet were there. She felt water and earth, felt his touch, his touch of words, felt water and earth. With a brush of his hand, he had washed her. With the touch of his eyes, he had cleansed her. She stroked the dust of long roads from his feet and dried them with her hair. Her tears had fallen. She dried them with her hair, and he was just passing through on his way home. She's like cold train. Blue jazz stumping in my chest each time I see the sway of her hips and that link that tells me she's all mine. Late at night she whispers low, slow words that sound to me like ice melting in a midsummer's heat, and like a downbeat she plays me, like a downbeat. Then there's no holding back as the soft rifts of her laughter spill around me and she's cradled in my arms like a tenor saxophone that my fingers are just aching to play. <laughs> yeah, let's see what I'm over here. Uh, when I was in Brighton, uh, that was a cool place too. Didn't go in on, on the big Ferris wheel though. But they had a big thing that spun all the way around, and I had a, a whole bunch of change in my pocket. And I didn't want to go on that. I would love to. I have a beautiful pier out there. As I wandered around Brighton, I found a, oh, page, did I get it? Page 88? Okay. As I wandered around Brighton, I found a cinema that was playing a movie I wanted to see. I found out that the next showing was, was not for two hours, so I walked to the end of the street and found a white rabbit and a mad hatter. <laughs> when I turned around to retrace my steps, I discovered I could not find the cinema again. I went back and forth three or four times and finally gave up and asked the white rabbit for directions. He thought for a moment, then he told me to go back the way I came. That way, he said, the way will appear before you before you get to the next street. So I ordered a Guinness and drew a picture of the scene around me. After drinking the beer, I did what I was supposed to do, and the cinema appeared before me. The most curious day it was. <laughs> Uh, the White Rabbit was a bar, and then they had the yeah. Mad Hatter across the street from that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see. Did find a lot of uh, the, the first person and the last person I met on my trip were both Muslims, mm -hmm. and that really affected me. Uh, the first person, uh, page five poem called Orlando. Orlando is the name of the airport in Stockholm. I see this. He was waiting, he was waiting for, he was waiting at the airport for his wife to come from Syria. Three and one half years it had been since he had seen her smile, warm as the fresh baked bread she had made him on the day he left to find his new life at far across the sea. Cradled in his arms, a bouquet of long-stemmed red roses, roses like the ones that grew in their garden, a garden now buried <clears throat> in stones and tears. He paced the polished floor in anticipation, his shoes squeaking with each step, and he knew that with each step she was coming closer to him. And this night she would be there, safe, hidden in his arms. Nice. <laughs> and then the last person, uh, page two, poem called Airport. He says that he tells his daughter stories every night to help them sleep. Sometimes he forgets where he was when he left off the night before. He tells me it's easier to drive a taxi in the mornings, this being Ramadan. Assalamu alaikum, I tell him. God be with you, 
he says to me. Mm -hmm. Did you want a book? Did she? Yeah, we got her a book. She, she's one of oh. <laughs> Do you want to buy one? Yes. Borrow one. Oh. I want to buy one. Okay, well, you can borrow this one for now. How much is that? Uh, $12. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I like to memorize a lot of my stuff. Well, uh, I, it's good to memorize your poems because you can't lose them that way most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Charles Bukowski uh, was one of the later on B poets, mm -hmm. and uh, so this, this is my Bukowski poem. I wanted Bukowski's woman. She was long and lean and always dressed in black. Her breath smelled of stale beer, of cinnamon, and of the cloves that she chewed on like candy. She opened my heart with a surgeon's skill, with words and smells, and with tears, and with a fear she howled in the night in the darkened alleyway behind the hotel where she lived with him. I could hear them fighting. It made me want her even more, and maybe want to drag her through my door, but she was Bukowski's woman. So I just sat in the bar across the street, cracking peanuts, throwing the shells on the floor. I wanted Bukowski's woman. She was long. And being always dressed in black. Oh. <laughs> uh, a poem called Catcher. He watched from the shadows. Catcher. His mind spoke to him. Catcher. The word came from his lips as he fingered the cold blue steel adjusted the weight slightly in his hand, embraced the feather trigger with the feather trigger with his index finger. A car stopped 20 feet from him. The father of a five-year-old boy hummed an old tune. His wife asked what they would do tomorrow. He told her they would talk about it when they got inside and pushed the door open. The man from the shadows asked, are you John Lennon? Are you John Lennon? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was from a, a workshop that we had to take a small piece of time and write a poem about it. Uh, for your Hamlet and another incantation. <laughs> That's in my tribute to Shakespeare and Jethro Tull. <laughs> I have not found the way today, and tomorrow a grave man will I surely be. I lay in darkness where my love sleeps in a womb where no heart beats. Outside there is light, but it won't come in. So I pretend that birds will sing again. I worry the silent air with sound cast waves of imagination there, and down my fingers dance thin lines upon this page of time, scratching out a slant of thought worrying a rhyme. My own voice speaks. I jingle and I jangle like all the rest. I recite a battered ballad for your amusement. Too soft, too soon. I jingle and I jangle, click my heels and the old dog howls. He wonders who I am and why I'm out so late this ruddy night, a cloud in flight. Reality grins, then clicks his toothless gums. There is no relief for praying knees upon this floor, which is my ceiling. Humbly it keeps me kneeling as if in penance for my skin. What, have all the lights gone out, stringing a filament lost again to a vacuum where it will wag no further, broken as it is from its end? So sure, not now, not now I lie here and wait, scrape this meager meal from off my plate, too late, too late to dine with silver spoons. And how sad looks the old man in the room. Mm. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, this next one, uh, I'm gonna, I usually, usually do these two poems together, a poet scar and uh, a dream maker. <laughs> uh, they're, uh, both of them are, should be on uh, SoundCloud and YouTube, I think. Something marked me with a poet scar like a werewolf by half-heeled, 
moon rising, thoughts dancing in my mind, craving, seeking escape, lips mimicking, hands translating mystic patterns into words, breathing life as they wake in dark shadows blazing like searchlights in a fog. Come along with me now as this lunar moon passes. I will show you the woods where thoughts grow like mushrooms that spring from the spores of dreams. His fingers move nimbly across the lighted panel before him, turning dials and flicking switches in such a hurried pace that his eyes could barely follow the movements of his hands, as if they had to. He had grown quite accustomed to controlling their motions through years of haphazard trials, which more often than not had led to far more failures than victories. As the years passed, he had mastered them, becoming, in his own words, quite efficient. His hands moved slower now, shutting down the myriad circuits which would no longer be of use to him, adjusting the tiny dials just right for the night that lay ahead. There, he said to himself, smiling, that just about does it. And with that, he reached over and touched the button marked dreams. <laughs> As you can tell, it's my, one of my favorite books. <laughs> uh, the, this is pretty much all the uh, the best poetry I did between 1970 and, <laughs> and uh, 1994. And uh, this is the rest of it. <laughs> so this is the second book. Hank and the Spirit. The rusted ring that holds my finger breaks my preoccupation with the opposite sex. So I tear down three beers in the spirit and listen to bad rock and roll. And the pressure in my pants is not an erection, it's just too much beer. <laughs> Band member groupies sit in halter, sh halter tops and shorts too short. They tease my eyes with glimpses of forbidden skin. Bright lights hide my eyes behind the brim of my felt black hat. But still they show my lips straight as a Kansas road. Too loud music blares, hiding the vocalist in background amplification as the bass vibrates through me. So I sit here in a spirit club where the spirits of my immediate past invade me with their scraping memories while pulsating strobes gyrate on the stage like faraway suns to be wished at, too hot to touch. My eyes drift to the black door, roughly marked men, then to the other colored in neon marked women. I dive into my vodka and lime, burying myself in darkness. Still the band plays on, opening my senses to numbness. I dream of foreign cities. Budapest stares at me from the wadded lottery ticket, slowly expanding in a puddle of spilled beer. And the car needs new tires, and there is no one to wrap my last fiver around. I must be getting old. I must have lost it somewhere between Black Sabbath and Jay Leno. <laughs> and I'll be reading in a city that starts with a K that's near Poughkeepsie. And uh, yeah, we're going to have to read this poem when I get there. It's called Soft Prophets. Soft Prophets roll their Mercedes through the streets of La Jolla. They have grown fat on quiche, jog one-tenth of a mile a day on treadmills that sweat on demand. They receive divine guidance from the mutual fund salesman in Detroit who swears he found the new holy scriptures under a moldy stack of National Geographics in Poughkeepsie. They gather their laptops in tight, formulated rows, precisely ten inches apart move their index fingers reverently to touch the enter key as the bell rings the close of the stock exchange and listen to the perfect notes of their computer's awakening. Oh, you got mail. <laughs> the soft prophets are quaking for the end of the millennium. They proudly display their Y2K pins to those who give the secret sign of affluence. Their teeth have all been replaced with porcelain implants. Their skin stretched taut as they hum their liposuction mantras in the great temple of Starbucks on Monday mornings where they're gathered for prayer and a cup of decaf. Departure. You don't understand sometimes the things I do. 
When I launch myself like a rocket ship, thrusters on full engines, blazing course, charted, planned, plotted, calculated, and leave you behind the music of my words, enveloped in my dreams. You think that I don't know or care to know that you wait for me where the flowers do bloom, and life does have a cycle. I go to find tomorrow, for I must go, and I must find tomorrow through the darkness of space without you. I could have stayed and felt you warmly beside me, never thinking of or alluding to the empty place that cries out my name when I look up to find the answers that whisper in the solar winds. They guide me now to another world away from you. And my first really good, my first good poem, the first one I thought was any good anyway, <laughs> after I've written 300 uh, bad poems. <laughs> Got them all at home if you want to see them. <laughs> I held a couple of sweet dreams that morning against the cold. The thoughts of her warm body like fire caressed my soul. But the warmth was quickly ended. The chill of loneliness began when a cup which I had treasured, dropped helplessly from my hand. The cup, it lay in pieces, broken upon the floor, my mind searching the rubble for dreams that were no more. Forever so quickly <coughs> ended, and never was meant to be. My love was vowed forever. Her love was gone from me. What's going on down in San Diego? The things that you do down there and your poetry group? Uh, actually, if you want to come to San Diego and listen to poetry, you come in the second week of the month. Mm -hmm. There's a, uh, if you hit it just right, most most of the readings are on the second second day of the month. If you hit it just right, you can go Monday night to uh, <coughs> Verbatim Bookstore in North Park. Uh, Tuesday night to uh, Cafe Cabaret on Adams Avenue. Oh. Wednesday night. Oh, Wednesday night. There was one up. Oh, Verbatim was on Wednesday. They changed it to Monday. Uh, Thursday night, you know, you can go to two readings if you can get there. Uh, one's at, on Adams Avenue at the Stats, and the other one is La Bodega uh, down in the Barrio. Uh, and then, Friday night, the uh, second Friday of the month is at Gelato Vera. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot going on. I'll have to come down and, wow, and hear you. Where, where do you uh, read? Uh, all of them. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's wonderful. I have a question for you about um, having your audience reading along with you. You're the first uh, feature we've had that has suggested we do that and offered us that opportunity. What do you think about that? Uh, I, I like it. I, I, I like. I think the audience enjoys it. Okay. And um, I wanted to know about your trip. Who organized your trip? How did that go? And, and like, was it funded by any of the uh, poetry organizations or? Uh, you... No, it was funded by me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, I started started out last year, and I had wanted to go over to England anyway, mm -hmm. and. Uh, my the publisher of the book uh, mm -hmm. uh, set up a, uh, a reading in Stockholm because one of the uh, people that uh, are published by them are was in Stockholm, and he set me up uh, three readings okay. in, in, in in Sweden, and then from there I just started look started looking up readings and. I went over to England. And yeah, the, the first one I went to England. Well, first one I went to in England was uh, at the place where you know, what's his name, Chuck Wesley. Uh, what, what, what was a famous preacher? What, uh, his last name was Wesley. Wesley. Wesley John Wesley. Yeah. yeah that okay. Was his last name. I, I, I performed in the church that he preached in, in, in London, and from there somebody called. The east coast of London told them they had, they had to get me over there, so they, they hooked me up over there. And then I, and my friend over here, uh, had that had lived in England, uh, he called his friends in in, in Swansea, 
you had them mm -hmm. set me up with a reading over there. So it was, it was just, there just like go. that. Yeah. And then this time we got them all set up now. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go on myself. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Yes. What instrument do you play? Uh, drums. <laughs> what was the question? Uh, instrument. Oh. Uh, the drums, you usually, I, I tried playing the, the guitar, but I, I know one song. <laughs> it never rains in Southern California. Oh, I that I like that one. was the first one I learned. I don't know. <laughs> and do you ever read with music? Have you ever uh, had yeah. anybody play behind you? Uh, yeah, if you look on SoundCloud and uh, and uh, YouTube for my name, it, you, there's, there's uh, a couple, couple of them there, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you again. Maybe have another round of applause for yeah. 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 I'm sorry. It wasn't a question, but. Chris, your, your poem about not wanting to write a poem about a tree yeah. reminds me of the little verse, I think that I shall never see a billboard lovely as a tree. In fact, until the billboards fall, I'll never see a tree at all. <laughs> uh, that sounds like a, sounds like you copied that one off of someone. <laughs> so, Alan, if we want to buy this, will you um, just autograph this for the Spoken Word Club and, and a, you know, the August date? I get an autograph Thank you. Too.